Welcome to Safe Work Leader Talks, a podcast series that explores the challenges, benefits and best practices of establishing a workplace safety culture with innovative New South Wales manufacturing health and safety leaders. I'm your host, Carol Duncan, and today we're talking to Blue Scope Steel Health and Safety Manager, Abby Ford, about the value and benefits of safer manufacturing workplaces and how building a culture of safety can improve workforce confidence, productivity and worker retention. Abby, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to work in health and safety. It's an interesting story. I just started a law degree when I was straight out of high school, feeling very sensible, um, fell in love, ended up moving to the Pilbara with my um, our husband. Uh, he worked in the mines there. I couldn't finish my law degree by correspondence um, out in the middle of nowhere. So um, wrapped up my bachelor's degree and then did postgraduate oh s So started my career yeah, in mining in the outback. So had a beautiful five years there and then moved back to the East Coast. Why health and safety? Why, after leaving your law degree, was this the thing that you chose to do? Health and safety seemed like a natural choice where I could get a balance between having a focus on on the law and what's really important, but also bringing a people focus into it. So it's actually become quite a neat fit. It's not something that I would have logically gravitated towards had I not had some life experience under my belt at the time. And it sounds like you've become quite passionate about it. Is it the people aspect of that that really drives you? Yeah, I think it is. And it's also working with um, Safe Work New South Wales in their mentoring program um, has also been a real eye-opener for me that people find health and safety quite difficult to navigate at times. I find that a bit frustrating because at the heart of it, it's quite a simple concept. It's about making sure that people come to work in the same, you know, in a, in a way and we send them home in the same state. And unfortunately, that can come quite complicated with the legislation, the codes, everything else and it. We kind of lose our way in what we're trying to achieve. So I love being able to pair things back, get back to what's at the heart, which is keeping people safe. The rest of the stuff ends up taking care of itself. Where do you think that actual difficulty comes from and the frustrations that you were trying to describe there in trying to get people to take it seriously, whether it's an enormous organisation yeah. like Blue Scope or it's a smaller organisation that you would be providing mentoring to, what do you think their frustrations or perhaps their fears are? I think it's all of the above and everyone's probably got a unique experience with what, with where their fears lie. Not everyone's fearful. I think I've definitely seen a shift in people just wanting, I want to know I'm doing the right thing or I want to um, make sure I'm compliant. Abby, let's dig down a little bit in some of the safety issues that confront your workforce. Yes. This is Blue Scope Steel, yeah. of course. So I assume we're talking heavy industry, we're talking machines that you would not believe, we're talking uh, some significant risks. Yeah. Across our portfolio in Australia, we've got everything from the biggest and the most complicated, you know, process safety risks in the country down to, you know, a branch in Batemans Bay that operates with a handful of people at the most. So we have a diverse range of risks and our business is always trying to improve the way that it carries its standards and its safety so that they have the ability to flex for those particular environments. So, you know, a standard we have at one end of our business needs to be um, relevant and applicable right down to the other end of it. How do you go about ensuring that right across the diversity of what is such a big business? Yeah, well, I think having a focus on leadership, safety leadership comes first and the systems support that. I think that's really important. So having systems in place that that are practical and able to be um, applied in different settings. At Blue we have a strong focus on management being accountable for safety. That's part of our safety beliefs as an organisation. Our leadership and our managers drive safety within our organisations and we design systems that support and allow them to do that. We're continually working at it. It's not something that you ever reach a point where you go, the job's done on that and it's just set and forget. Safety is ongoing for us. We're continually reviewing what we do. We're continually challenging ourselves around it to make sure that the things that we've put in place actually do the things that we've designed them to do. My guest is Abby Ford, who is the Health and Safety Manager for Blue Scope Steel. What is the basic core belief around safety at Blue Scope? At Blue Scope, we have a core belief around all injuries can be prevented. That's basically where the starting point for us. We have a zero harm philosophy and out of that we have a, some safety beliefs. For us, those safety beliefs underpin everything that we do. You know, they talk about talk about managers being accountable for safety, that training is essential for employees, that employee input is also essential for us. 
those principles underpin everything that we do. And as we evolve as an organisation, we breathe new life into what those things mean by drawing in new concepts around safety to thinking or, you know, social psychology of risk. And what we do is make sure that those safety beliefs are always relevant in the context that we're operating and that we're always finding new ways to be curious about how we can improve in any aspect of our safety beliefs. Health and safety managers, Abby, like yourself, are in a, a very interesting position. You are in the middle. You're in between a workforce that you want to keep safe and you want to send home at the end of the day to the families. And you also are working with an executive, a a managerial team who have other motivators as well. Of course, they have well-being of a workforce. They have moral and economic drivers. How do you negotiate that space in between? I think at Blue Scope, I'm, I'm very fortunate that our management and our executive know that doing safety well is simply good business. So when you're doing safety well, work's more predictable, you're getting quality gains, all the effort that you're putting into safety, there's byproducts that you get in other areas. So we're very fortunate that our that's part of the fabric of our management team. They just understand that. I'm aware that not every company has the benefit of, of having that sort of managerial culture established. And I think that's the challenge for people until you've been on a journey where you've seen, you know, like a lot of some of our lessons we've learned the hard way. We've um, we have a suite of our own codes of practice that are basically built off really serious injuries that we've had in our business so that we create this formwork around those risks to make sure that we never have those type of incidents again. And the challenge really is how you get those lessons so far embedded in your organisations without having to learn things the hard way. That's something I don't know and I don't know. And and maybe if people did know that, you know, we'd be in a different um, state in Australia with workplace fatalities. But I think um, I'm very lucky at Blue Scope that that's not where my focus goes. I don't spend my time convincing our management team that safety is important because they already understand it. They see it every day. You also work as a mentor for Safe Work New South Wales. You provide your skills and knowledge and expertise in trying to help others create a great safety culture like you have at Blue Scope Steel. So if you're talking to a health and safety manager or some other leadership in an organisation and you know that that is a problem, that there is a health and safety culture yet to be developed strongly enough, how do you help encourage that? What are your words of advice and wisdom to people who, who may be trying to create and grow that good culture in their own organisation? The Safe Work New South Wales mentoring program has been a real eye-opener for me. I've worked with big business, but that's really let me see firsthand what the challenges are like for small businesses and the reservations that they have around strengthening their commitment to health and safety, usually not because they don't see the importance of it, but because they're fearful of the complexity and the cost that it might pose to their organisation. So my experience with working with these organisations is that it's often just firstly debunking some myths that they might hold themselves. They'll say, you know, I don't know anything about, you know, my safety management system. I don't know where to start. I usually find that's not not correct. I usually find that they have a really good understanding of what their people do. Can we debunk some of those myths? What are they? That they don't know what they need to do. The first one is I just, you know, usually they'll say, I just want to know that I'm doing all the right things because they might want to make make sure that if they have an interaction with a regulator or if something goes wrong, that uncovered. You, you generally hear that term. What I find is that asking questions like, well, do you know what your people do? Do you know how they do it? Uh, do you get interested in ways that you can make things safer and easier for them? The answers to those questions give more of an indication to me about how under control or, or what opportunities there are with that person's safety journey with their business because often it's less about what fancy management system you have attached to your organisation and more about how well you understand the risks in your business and whether you're working hard to reduce those risks to your people. There's some really interesting ones. The other ones um, that I love hearing about are where somebody's told them, you know, that they need to get a fancy risk assessment for a piece of kid and they, they do that because they think they don't know how to do it themselves. And when you kind of break down what, what the purpose of that process is, So instead of focusing on the process, which might look quite complicated, getting back to focusing on the purpose that you're doing it for, you sort of see a penny drop and they think, well, of course I can do this for myself. I understand my machinery or my truck or whatever it is. There's no reason I couldn't do this for myself because I know my business. 
So they're the real um, aha moments that I live that I live for in that program um, that make it really worthwhile because you actually see them starting to grasp what they need to do. And it, it's not tangled up in a you know, complicated code of practice or a piece of legislation that's difficult to understand. It's actually just about managing safety. And um, if you do that really well, the legislation will take care of itself. Coming up, Abby shares her thoughts on mentoring other organisations on building a safety strategy, the challenges they face in doing so, and the benefits of a great health and safety culture. Oh, and wait until you hear her story of a ship on fire in port. More from Abby after this message from Safe Work New South Wales. Employers and management play an important role in workplace health and safety. Workers in the manufacturing industry look to their leaders for safety guidance. Research shows that after training, workers in manufacturing prefer to receive safety messages in their workplace through signs, posters, fact sheets and toolbox talks. To support leaders in manufacturing, Safe Work New South Wales has forklift and machine safety education materials that can be downloaded or printed and shared with workers. Visit safework.nsw.gov.au slash manufacturing today. Be the leader your workers need. Safety starts with you. My guest is Abby Ford, Blue Scope Steel Health and Safety Manager. Abby, you referred earlier to what can be a very heavy and tragic price of a lack of workplace safety and workplace accidents and therefore the importance of ensuring that all of the systems are in place and that the, the culture is in place. Is that part of the conversation that has to be had with both senior management and also with the workplace to make them fully understand the potential risks? Because I think a lot of us go through our sail through our lives thinking, it'll never happen to me. Yeah, as part of the mentoring program, yes, definitely. I think Blue Scope's reached a maturity point where I, where I feel like in my role we have those conversations aren't aren't nearly as raw or they don't need to be as raw um, as you've described because it's part of who we are now. It's part of our history. There's enough people in our business who've been involved in things that they never want to be involved with again, whether that's here or elsewhere through their other experience. But certainly with the mentoring program, yes, bringing that home to people and just helping them to be able to prioritise what's in front of them has been really important. So you might come across someone through the mentoring program, a small business that feels quite overwhelmed with the work that's in front of them. For me, it's about going, right, let's, we have to start putting one foot in front of the other. Let's focus first on the things that could kill people in your business. Do you know what they are? So once you've kind of identified those things that um, can kill people, let's get that right and let's work back from there. All the other stuff might you know, could be feel really interesting or easy to work on. That's not where our focus needs to be. So that would be my advice um, for any small business would be concentrate on the stuff that is either going to kill someone or have a serious life-changing impact, permanent impact on a, on a person. Get that stuff right and work back from there because otherwise you can create a lot of noise and not actually work on the right stuff. What are the benefits of a great health and safety culture? Any Google search will show you what, um, you know, that there's been a ton of empirical evidence on this now. Um, you get improvements uh, with productivity, you have cost savings, you'll get a happier, healthier workforce. So um, depending on what, what you work on and how much effort you put into it, there's benefits galore. I think once you start focusing on safety and you can start seeing how planning for things, having better conversations, better quality conversations about the work that you do, you'll get efficiencies in a range of areas. And I think they, they can't always be defined, but once you start on that journey, it's very hard to break the momentum of it. So it's something that will continually, can, you know, you'll get um, compounding benefits from over time. Hypothetical for you, Abby, I am an employee. Yeah. Maybe I'm a new employee. Maybe I've come in under a contract of some description from a yeah. uh, provider and I see something that I don't think is right, but I'm scared to say anything about it. Maybe I'll lose my job. Maybe I won't be invited back. Maybe I'll never be offered that particular contract again. That is the other end of the culture, isn't it? Where you need to somehow create an environment where employees can say, this is a thing and not fear repercussion. In fact, feel proud of perhaps identifying that problem. Yeah, and in those particular situations when people do raise something, management's response to those particular um, issues that have been raised is critical. 
because you will set the tone for how comfortable somebody will be to raise something in the future. So firstly, we make it abundantly clear to people who work on our site that we want, we want to hear the bad news. We want to hear the things that aren't going so well for them or things that they see, because unless we know about them, we're not in a position to be able to fix them firstly. And secondly, when they do raise them, it's really important to show a deep level of curiosity about what that person's asking and then follow through with it. So that's the culture we try and um, cultivate and reinforce uh, with our people. Like with anything that looks, di like, looks different in lots of different different ways um, it looks different for some people it looks different for some managers but that's the foundation of what we try and cultivate we can't be scared as a management team we can't be scared to hear bad news from our people we can't be scared to hear the stuff that we might not want to hear or we're denying ourselves an opportunity to get better so when you glue those two ends of that spectrum together a leadership yeah. who want to engage who want to hear who want their workforce to be safe and a workforce that feels they can say hey there's a problem the outcome of that is going to be fantastic. You can't do good safety without employee involvement and you can't do good safety without good leadership. So um, that is absolutely the bread and butter of safety culture. It's the core foundation. Management don't have all the answers. They need to hear from the people who do the work to help them find the way forward. And the people who do the work have to be able to trust their managers to treat the information that they send up with, with interest um, and they have to be able to trust them to follow through on things. Okay, Abby, can you share with us an example of something that you have implemented through your time at Bluescope? It might be something that you've observed or that an employee has brought to you. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think some of, well, some of the best things that I've, I've seen in practice uh, in my time is an ability to, and it's it's not it doesn't it's not a system, it, it's not a form, it's actually just consistency in how you behave and operate to set a standard. So, for me, one of the best things is seeing leaders consistently being able to have conversations about safety or to align themselves with what's really important in a really high stakes, you know, in a, in a high stakes or high pressure type of scenario. Um, one of the best examples of that I've seen, we had a ship at here, at, down here on the port that caught fire, um, the fire burnt for about a week in a conveyor system. Um, it was a ship that was um, docked on our port, um, but because it was in our location, we were obviously involved because um, our people work close to that. And there was one, one part of, of the recovery work um, where we had a very small tidal window to do a piece of work. The work was something that we'd never done before. It wasn't particularly high risk, but it was something that we hadn't done before. Um, we had, you know, fire commanders, anyone that you can think of was sort of there and being involved. And one of our supervisors at the time um, pulled everyone together in the work group because he said, you know, we need to run through this um, JCA. And I remember hearing a few people say, come on, we've got 20 minutes to do this job. Like, we've got to get going. He said, yeah, I know, it's, I know that feels important to you, but this is what we need to do to make sure we get this work done. And that for me is is true safety leadership when everything else can seem really important everyone else you know thinks everything else is important but you actually have the courage and the resolve to stand there in the middle of all of that stuff and to just hold the line and to do um, to make sure that people know what's expected of them and that they're going to be safe to execute that task so that's something that definitely stays with me and I, I remind myself of that and I remember in that exact time I actually took two steps back and I took a photo of that particular toolbox because I never wanted to forget that moment um, in my career to just go yeah well if, if that's the time that you can you can pull out that sort of leadership and it doesn't matter what I come across in in my time that there'll always be time to you know to make that a priority so have Blue Scope's leaders always had that strong health and safety culture? I think Blue Scope has a fantastic safety culture uh, from the shop floor employees to the managers. Like m most businesses of our size and our risk profile, we've been through a journey over a number of years that's helped us evolve that, that culture. Back in the 90s, we were engaged with we were engaged with DuPont. They helped us really kickstart what we would call now as, you know, our, our kind of modern safety journey. They were the ones who gave us some tools to see things that we just wouldn't have seen before and to really help us understand safety in a whole new context. Prior to that, we didn't have the level of expertise or understanding and that really 
helped bring our leadership team together and see things. We continue on that journey. It's not as if you can get a dose of something and, and the job's done. We continually go out, go out and see what's new in the world, what's new in safety thinking, and we try and embed that back into our processes to continue to evolve in this space, to breathe new life to things that might have, you know, parts of the foundation of our safety management system, but the job is never done. Um, so our, our culture will continue to, in, to evolve. Safety culture is a, is a component of that. It's just a part of our overall um, company culture. We'll continue to find ways to improve that as the context of the world moves on too. So, you know, we can start to do one thing and then as, as this year has shown us, we continually need to adapt. So, yeah. How does the leadership at Blue Scope or the organisation as a whole actually measure success? That's a really wonderful question and a really wonderful question for us because we're, we're challenging ourselves around that too. We've got traditional measures around safety um, associated with injury rates and, you know, our engagement levels with our employees, um, you know, face-to-face engagement on the job. We're really challenging ourselves around how we can measure safety. So we're not saying that those things are wrong in and of themselves, but we're always looking for new ways to, to give us better insight into what's going on with safety and certainly with the, some of the work I've been doing around um, big data and um, predictive analytics. We want to look at ways to use all of the tools and kit that we've got out on the plant to um, give us better insights into things. But you can't do that without investing heavily into some um, grassroots people-focused programs too because the two go hand in hand. You can't just read numbers and because you only get one side of the story with what's going on in safety. So there are ways that we're challenging ourselves around how to measure safety. It's a golden question across the entire our industry, what the best measure is. My personal view is I don't think there's one there's one good measure. I think that it's it's a range of indicators or artifacts in your business and not everything that counts can be counted either. So I think it's about just having a really deep level of understanding about your business. The financial bottom line though for an organisation that has a good health and safety culture though would have to be substantial. Oh, without a doubt. And that's been well documented too. So some of the other economic benefits that you're going to get from managing safety is obviously that you'll get lower injuries. So lower injuries to most businesses means that you'll get lower workers' compensation premiums and then lower risk of having civil liability cases lodged against you in the future. So there's um, real tangible cost savings that you can get from having better oversight of your safety management. So they're really direct things. There's a whole range of other indirect um, cost benefits in that you'll there'll be less rework. You'll have better trained people to, to, to perform work. So you're you're more you're more likely to get work right in the first place and reducing equipment damage, all that kind of stuff. So there's there's no doubt that there's there's direct cost um, avoidance and um, and indirect cost avoidance with managing safety properly. So what would your top three tips be for other leaders in manufacturing, for example? My first tip is to just be authentic as a leader. And I think you don't have to know all of the answers. That's the first that's the first tip. So if you can just be yourself and be curious about things, you will find things out about your business that you wouldn't have the opportunity to if you get around thinking that you know everything about your business. The second thing is seek input from the the people that do the work. Essentially, they are the experts on the work. Any issue that you see or that they've seen that they raised you, they will probably have a view on how to fix that. And in my experience, it won't be too far from where you, you end up in the end usually. And the third, the third tip I'd have is to really just focus on your critical risks first. So if you're starting out, focus on the stuff that is going to make the most difference in the beginning. Don't try and be everything to anyone. If you're starting, concentrate on the stuff that's going to kill your people or cause a serious traumatic injury. Get that correct and then radiate out from there because if you do something that might make you feel good or your people feel good that you're working on safety and it's not really the stuff that's going to matter if something goes horribly wrong, then I think you know, you, you run the risk of not putting your energy into the right area. What's a great day at work for you, Abby? Uh, a great day at work for me is actually where I spend the entire day out with people doing amazing work in our business. 
So if we have a shutdown on or, um, you know, even just our normal operations, going out and spending time with people, talking to them, understanding how they do work and what ways or what ideas they have around how we can make that safer or more efficient um, or better, that's a great day at work for me. I'm not someone who's comfortable sitting in front of a computer all day. Um, so I think they're the t when we have that beautiful, you know, engagement with our people where they share their ideas, you know, they're interested in helping us improve on our safety journey, that's a fantastic day of work for me. How do you then share that experience and that passion for keeping people safe back to your leadership? I'm very lucky that I've learned a lot of what I've learned from our leadership. Our leadership, uh, you know, do a, an amazing job and they're much better safety leaders than I'll ever be because they spend time understanding what their people do. Um, they're there on the good days. They're there on the crappy days. And I think that I am very blessed in my role that I don't spend a lot of my time having to tell any of our managers how to be good safety leaders. Um, they've got it in spades. For me, it's a matter of helping give them, you know, some technical support if I need to, um, supporting their people with questions that they have to keep the whole, you know, show just, just moving along and, and getting those incremental changes because that's the stuff that helps sustain the change it's not these big revolutionary you know things that come in it's it's the day-to-day -day incremental change that makes it sustainable and if we can all work together to do that you know collectively then that's job done for me you love this don't you <laughs> I do I do I, I couldn't you couldn't do it if you didn't love it and I think in safety I've never met someone who doesn't work in safety and doesn't love it you you you, you couldn't do it you wouldn't do it my thanks to Abby Ford for sharing her insights. Ultimately, the value of a safety culture is the protection of your most important asset, your workforce. Yet every day, Safe Work New South Wales inspectors attend devastating incidents in the manufacturing sector that are, for the most part, completely avoidable. In New South Wales manufacturing, more than 40,800 workers' compensation claims were lodged between 2013 and 2016, with a total cost of $558 million. Tragically, 24 people lost their lives during that same period. The investment of time, commitment and leadership in developing a culture of safety in your workplace is therefore invaluable, with clear benefits to staff safety, loyalty and productivity that result in positive impacts on your bottom line and your reputation. I'm Carol Duncan and this has been a Safe Work Manufacturing Leadership Talk. In the next episode, I discuss designing safer workplaces with Yates Safety and Sustainability Business Lead, Tamara Scanlon. To learn more about leading a strong workplace safety culture or to listen to the other episodes in this series, visit safework.nsw.gov.au slash leadership.